Hey everyone out there, welcome to another uh, episode of Uncensored Solar TV brought to you by my amazing team here at Solar Wolf Energy. And I'm bringing today a special guest with us today, Mr. Josh Weller here from Cary Stamp and Company Wealth Advisors. And uh, Mr. Weller here is well versed and focused on sustainable investing and investing in renewable energy and the like. Um, obviously, he and I have a very good correlation here into the future of what sustainable energy looks like here going forward. I think the transition from the late 1800s to 1900s what the fossil fuel industry looked like then is very much on par of what the future of EVs and electric renewables look like going forward. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Weller. Mr. Weller, thanks for joining us. Ted, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Really impressed with what you guys are doing at Solar oh. Likewise, sir. The admiration is, uh, is, is, is coupled back. So a quick question about you. Uh, you're, in, uh, you're, you're residing now in Florida. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. And uh, born and raised in Jersey. That's correct. Yeah, I grew up about 25 miles from Manhattan in Morris County and then uh, lived my, most of my adult life up in New England. I was in Worcester for a while and then Portsmouth, New Hampshire for a big chunk of time and then in Boston for about 10 years. And then the weather finally got to me. <laughs> As it always does. I, I've always wanted to live in a warm uh, environment and uh, it was uh, great to move down here to Florida, but uh, I do miss Boston I, and New England. It is, uh, it is, there is a, there is a, a certain type of, uh, yeah, there is a certain type of emotional connection, I feel like, to, uh, to Boston for a lot of people once you spend a little time here, like you did. Uh, Portsmouth, I, I think, is a, a beautiful, beautiful city. I think you'd agree. I loved it there. Absolutely yeah. loved it. The people there are definitely unique. I, 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 have a, I feel like a real connection when I'm there. They make you feel home, you know? Yeah, no question. It's a really welcoming place, uh, hip community, fantastic place to live. Sure. So tell us about uh, tell us about what it is you guys were focused on and what it is, the overall scope, and, and really how it began and how you kind of got into this journey. Yeah, well, our firm is a full service financial advisory firm and we manage money, but we also do financial planning. So we look holistically at a family's uh, entire financial life and help them plan for the future. I specialize on the investing side and in sustainable investing and sustainable investing essentially for those who haven't been introduced to it yet, sustainable investing is aligning your use of capital and assets with your values and belief system and causes to an extent because you, you can build a portfolio and have certain pieces of the portfolio focused on specific causes, which they call impact investing. Uh, so there are little subsets within the bigger universe of sustainable investing. And it can, it can get a little bit confusing because there have been many names for sustainable investing over time, over the decades. It started about five decades ago. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there are three facets to it that are important. And the first is performance. And one of the great myths about sustainable investing is that you, your performance to results have to suffer if you, uh, invest with your values, mm -hmm. but that is a myth. There are three facets or benefits to sustainable investing for individual investors or corporate 401k plans, which is another area that could see a lot of growth in sustainable investing. And the first is performance. This, this sustainable investing is first and foremost investing. And the goal is to produce competitive returns or better returns, which actually has been the case lately. And we can talk about that in more detail. The second is impact. By investing in sustainable funds, uh, which are also commonly referred to as ESG funds, some mm -hmm. folks may be familiar with that acronym, which stands for Environmental Social Governance. And people refer sometimes to this space as ESG investing, but it's actually not an investing process. ESG is a data set mm -hmm. and rating system. Uh, but by investing in sustainable funds, you're positively impacting the planet and humanity. And at right now, there's no compromise in performance. And the last facet is uh, emotional fulfillment and satisfaction, because for those who truly care about the planet, the future for our children and generations to come, issues like climate change, water and air pollution, social justice, equality, good corporate governance, 
there is an emotional fulfillment by using your capital and assets uh, in a positive way. I, th I think you would agree with me that as we look, you know, in the last few years now and looking to the future, that I, I believe that what's, what's great about being in business today and looking forward is that all those things are actually of value, not just to potential investors, but to employees and to clients. Whereas in, you can remember, you know, 15, 25 years ago, junk bonds, lean and mean, everybody gets steamrolled. It was about what pencils and what doesn't. Who cares about your HR department because, hey, we're making money, right? There's been a massive, massive shift in investing in, I think, almost every facet of every industry uh, with regards to, hey, you know, what is the talent looking for in that particular industry? Do you guys have daycare at the facility? Do you guys have a gym at the facility for your, for your staff to work, you know, work out during work for your own health? Because... You know, there's good physical health, brings good mental health, right? I think what's going on right now in the investing side is folks like yourself are stewarding a lot of people's, you know, finances looking forward and, and as your own as well. I think what's, what's really important and pretty impactful is that that, those core values are, are actually important and investors want to know more and above the balance sheet and the p l is what's the corporate culture there like? Um, you know, I think if we can if we can look at the WeWork uh, pandemic, we'll call that right. The, what happened over there? I think, and then you look at uh, you know the investments they made, and then they just kept throwing good money after bad. Um, I, I think there is a, a large warning flag up for the last few that try to hold on to that party uh, giga kind of uh, culture, which is, hey, let's blow this up as fast as possible. Don't worry about a return. Don't worry, we're gonna make a return at some point. Let's just keep growing. You know, you remember this, Amazon did that uh, in the very beginning. It was, don't worry, about the, don't worry about the profit. We're just gonna keep dumping money in, we'll get there. I think with somebody like Jeff Bezos, it worked out because clearly he had the discipline and the constant fight within. And then Adam, um, I forget, was it news? Adam, um, what was the gentleman's name from WeWork? But when you watch that story, what's that? I think it was Newman. Adam Newman, that's what it was. When you look at that story, um, you know, it, it, it kind of parallels a little bit to the Uber situation. But with, uh, with Travis, uh, obviously, you know, a more hard-nosed but more disciplined, whereas Adam, I think, was just a party, party, party atmosphere. Didn't have, I think, maybe as part of the, because he's in his early 20s, was, was a good reason. I, I, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But when you look at what, what investors are looking at what's important today versus what was important you know, 20 years ago, which I think a lot of people still have in, their, in the back of their mind, right? And uh, you've, you've seen it, no question, there's a major shift into corporate culture, the governance, like you said, how the board uh, you know, holds the CEO and the C-suite executives accountable. Um, and you know, digging into the, the under people, the, the subordinates, is finding out, like, are they happy? Do these people want to come to work? Is the shift now with this whole COVID thing, is the shift, do the people you have, management, have the responsibility to work from home and keep moving the needle, right? I think these are all things that need to be looked at. Clearly, you guys have your eyes on a lot of things. Um, you know, those three outlines, I only picked you know, the last one there to really review one in depth because I feel like almost everybody sees this today. I think you'd agree. It's interesting, Ted, because in 2019, the money flow into sustainable funds quadrupled. And then in here in 2020, in the first quarter, you know, the market had a that severe drop and the drawdown in sustainable funds was incrementally less than traditional investing. And then through June of uh, 2020, right, just ended, um, the after the second quarter, the I can't talk about individual uh, ETFs and uh, mutual funds and stocks due to compliance issues, but indexes I can address. And the indexes uh, that were filtered for ESG almost uniformly outperformed traditional indexes. So it's pretty amazing what's going on. And as I mentioned before, that the big myth is that 
performance has to suffer if you invest with your values, which it's what, what's happening now is even if you don't care at all <laughs> about these issues, it actually makes financial sense. Mm -hmm. Which honestly, for those I think who, who, who have businesses, you know, some of them myself on the operator side, um, when you run your business, if you can figure out how to run it, not just with the checkbook, but also from within here, um, I think it comes across most importantly to customers, right? Because if you don't have customers, your shareholders will be upset, right? So obviously sales and revenue cures, well, they, sales cures all, as they say, right? But, you know, if, if your customers today are looking at things like, are there so, you know, if myself and another individual have the same business, my building has solar panels on it, theirs does, and we provide the same core values, the same product, the same pricing index. But again, um, we're a green company. I think today, and only going forward, this will, this will strengthen. I think that is actually one of the defining factors when you look at it. Um, and as you said, like, you know, today, that's a lot more emphasis on it. Going back to the, you have to lose a little bit of money to invest in, you know, caring for your people and, and, and making sure that the board is, is well knowledge on all things, what we're looking for, the optics of this as well. Honestly, I, I think now more than ever, it's super important to be awake enough to understand your market in all those regards of what does it look like to not just my shareholders? What does it look like to my customers? Also, a question I think nobody's really asked until recently is, what does it look like to my own staff? I feel like, you know, for the last hundred years, what your employees and what your staff thought of you was almost kind of like a, a last, well, we'll get to that later kind of thing. And now it's right up there. I think uh, websites like Glassdoor and those things help bring transparency to investors. No question. And, you know, when employees come in and see that a 401k program has sustainable investing options, that says a lot. And not many do at the moment. So that's a potential area of, of growth, although there's a little issue going on, on going on right now with the uh, uh, government uh, that we don't need to get into too heavily. But uh, that's a huge opportunity. So, yeah, I think the, the thing is that there, there's a lot of pressure on corporations and they are to be responsible corporate citizens in all of these factors, environmentally, socially, and with through good governance. But a lot of those uh, initiatives actually improve the bottom line. If you lower your carbon footprint, you're saving money on energy year after year after year. It's binary. If you if you offer sustainable funds in a 401k or other employee benefits, you re, you attract and retain better talent. So there, it, you know, gender equality, racial equality, these are all positives. So um, it, it's, it's an interesting environment. But, you know, the, the interesting thing, too, is that it used to be that governments were having to uh, monitor corporations. <laughs> and, and it's becoming more of a situation where it's the, the other way around, which is pretty amazing. I agree. I agree. Little issues everywhere, obviously. But. No question, right? But when you have, um, you know, the CEO of uh, Salesforce, you know, donating, you know, billions of his own money into uh, certain areas of San Francisco and in L.A. for homelessness, um, kind of basically taunting, as you said, like the government, like, hey, you should be doing this. Why am I doing this? Like, I'm grateful that I'm, I'm in a position Mark Benioff is a good guy. <laughs> You know, I'm in a position I can do that. You guys should be doing this. How come I can solve the problem with uh, with only two billion? You guys couldn't. Like, you know, um, like you said, it's almost like like corporate America is is at this point um, holding holding the government responsible. That's a, it's a great point. I never thought of that, but as soon as you said that, I, yeah, the light went off. But um, you know, I'll, I'll say this. What's I'd say? What's your? Let me ask you this. What's your biggest hurdle um, with regards to explaining to potential investors um, that because of this, now you and I obviously understand that sustainable investing today makes sense. And as a saying, if it makes sense, it makes sense. But I think a lot of America, um, a lot of people, I think a lot of people, you know, in the demographic of uh, the baby boomer generation, 
and the generation before that. I think they still have that that idea that again you have to look, you know, oh you guys use all recycled paper that costs more, and I think they have that still in their head. What's your biggest hurdle in in, in trying to bring over um, people and open up their mind to really educate them about that? Well, what's interesting is the big money institutions and organizations have already made this move. So most of the money flow that has happened in this evolution over the decades has come from big money. So foundations, family offices, uh, some funds do impact investing, um, uh, major institutions have are investing heavily in these areas. And what's lagging behind is retail inv individual investors and corporations with 401k plans. So the, and the biggest issue with those investors, because in general, they're less sophisticated, is performance. So this misconception and myth that I've mentioned a few times, and you, you know, they're, they're jumping off from things, as you say, like, you know, using recycled paper is more expensive. So there becomes this assumption that to invest with your values is going to be more expensive. So the, the performance issue just has to be hammered over and over and over again, because right now the evidence is mounting in favor of sustainable investing on a performance basis. Sure. And, and performance speaks the loudest, right? If, if you can show if you can show actual, tangible, transparent numbers that look, it's, it's really working now. You know, um, I, I think there is a certain amount of uh, responsibility and kind of uh, appreciation for what I would think, you know, with the trailblazers who were trying to do this 10, 15 years ago and who actually did it. The, those who were, because as you know, then it was uh, expensive, then it did lose money. Right, you look at a T12 statement of a company trying to switch over to these products and these new progressive ideas, these companies did lose money. I think not enough appreciation is given to those companies and those CEOs and those operators that, that understood that, look, we're gonna run our company, it's going to hurt for a little while, but if we do this at scale, the numbers make sense. And you know, there's, there was there's countless board seats that were vacated because of this. How many CEOs and CFOs probably were asked to leave because, you know, the board might not have supported the long-term vision, right? It's not, it's not just, well, good, look, we have another quarter to make up the numbers. It's not like, look, in 17 quarters, in 27 quarters, this will make sense. Stick with me on it. And as you know, part of the problem is in some of these larger corporations, the, uh, the CEOs don't stick around for 10 years, right? It's a, it's a three to five. You know, very. I think we're not getting very many Jamie, uh, Jamie Diamonds or Bob Igers sticking around and, and making. Hey, look, my my uh, my exit's going to be in three to four more years, and I've been here for a long time already. I think these are becoming more rare today, and I think that that kind of alludes to some of those trailblazers, right? They are gone by. Um, no question. You know what's interesting? The the first socially responsible mutual fund was founded and initiated in Portsmouth. New Hampshire. Okay. 1971. Wow. Little fun fact for you. So that goes back. Okay. So there were some, there were some some real uh, some future seers there, huh? Some people who could see around corners. That's that's pretty impressive. And they the, actually the the firm is still there, and they were bought by another firm from the UK. But they're very active and very well known in the space. <laughs> uh, follow up question for that is uh, sustainable philanthropy. Something that's coming around and growing, an idea. I, I think, um, you know, those of us like myself and, and you, who are, who are you, you're definitely within the industry far more than I am, but, um, you know, folks like myself, when we gather at board meetings or in, 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 in our sewing circle, if you will, um, this is something that we discuss, both as an individual uh, responsibility as, as an operator, but also as, as, you know, as we start to put our funds together and, and invest them in different things. Instead of just, for those who don't know, for those, you know, sustainable philanthropy is investing in ideas so that we can donate and help the greater good, but do it where the, the venture actually is self-sustainable, right? So, and I know you're well-versed on what this looks like going forward. Can you kind of paint a picture of, of where you think this is and where it could go? 
looking ahead? Well, in my world, that that's called impact investing. Okay. So it it's, I mean, it could be individuals, but it's usually family offices, foundations, uh, could be corporate foundations or CEO. You know, the foundation of a CEO or, but usually the form that takes is they invest directly in companies or initiatives that are working within areas that are tied to their missions as either as individuals or entities. So they're, it's not, they're not generally, they're not investing in funds. They're invent, investing in startups that are doing um, renewable energy or uh, in specific areas that they feel very strongly about. And it's called impact because they're targeting the, the specific impact. Sure. So it's, and it's, there's some just unbelievable stuff going. I just read a story this morning about a company here in Florida that is trying to harness the energy of the Gulf Stream. <laughs> it's amazing. So the Gulf Stream is perpetually moving at like three yeah. to six miles an hour. And they're, they, they've got a system where they're submerging. You're, you're, you're more of an engineering person than I am, but they're, they're submerging, I don't know, turbines or I don't, I don't even know what, the, I didn't have a chance to really get into it, but um, they're gonna be harnessing that path, that constant flow of the Gulf Stream. And I guess the test has proved to be accurate. So that could be a case where somebody uh, steps in, even like a private equity firm might say, wow, that's interesting, I wanna invest in that. Yeah. I, I love the concepts and ideas, and it seems like on that side of it, it seems like the ideas are coming faster and far more available and actually have a chance. I think in large part, it's to the whole topic of what we're discussing at hand. The reason why I think these things are actually attainable now is because I, I believe it's easy to attract money to these kinds of ideas because I think uh, the, the fear of missing out is one of them. Two, it goes back to what this is really about, which is sustainable investing, right? Nobody wants to miss out on the next Uber. If we all had a shot, we'd all jump in on the next one, right? But if we can do it for the right reasons, you know, and, and those who have children, you, you know, you, you want to leave the earth in a better place than you inherited it. I think that's, uh, that's just a parental uh, thing that we all have. I know I have, uh, I have four children, and I absolutely, that's a key reason why I still want to do this forever, um, is because I know it's scale. Not just, you know, the people here in our offices, but like the industry in general, you know, coal and oil and all these fossil fuels and natural gas, if, I'm not saying we need to get completely get rid of them, but if we can hold off on them, I think on a, on a country's national security issue, we can always go back to them, we always have them. It's kind of like having money in the bank, right? It's like having a nice little war chest. But if we can start making the transition to green renewable energy, but have that as a go-to in case something should happen, I think that's, that's the wealth of the United States as a country. I mean, I don't, I don't know what you look like uh, if people write about the, the $21 trillion deficit where we're in, but when you look at the balance sheet of America and our assets and the human capital we have here, I think, um, I think we're net positive in a great way overall. Um, I think you'd agree. Yeah, Ted, it's interesting. I, there's an e ETF that I was looking at the other day, and it's a fossil fuel free ETF of large cap. Uh, mm -hmm. stocks. So just imagine if you're an individual investor and your large cap portfolio, as an example, is, is in that fund, which guarantees there's no exposure whatsoever to fossil fuel. Because what happens to another thing with uh, sustainable investing, there are funds where you could actually, if, for example, if an oil company had very strong corporate governance and social ratings, so it's ESG. So if they were very strong on the s and there is a slight chance they could end up in an ESG fund uh, because it's a, a combination rating in some funds. So that's, you know, it's a vetting process that these fund managers go through and it can be, it's, it's important to work with somebody who knows what they're doing because sure. they're, you could invest in something and and think it's one thing and find out you're invested in in a oil company, like Enron. Right? <laughs>
right? It can go that way. I, I think uh, you're 100% right. Now more than ever, I think uh, people, especially with this whole COVID thing, I think people are realizing that, you know, although platforms like TD Ameritrade and all that, they all switched over to that, you know, zero uh, cost per trade. I think a lot of people would, would really like to, to manage their own funds. But as we know, most of Americans don't understand it enough. And I think they, they follow the masses and they follow the Instagram and they throw on CNBC and they see, you know, Tesla or something going, just going skyrocketing, but they don't look, you know, pull an 8K and actually read it and go through it line by line, which folks like yourself not only do that, but can take that and then really transform that language into investors and break it down as to, look, here's the concerns that I have. I'm an individual. I am your champion of finance, and I'm going to steward you through this. Here's what all this jargon means, because as you know, on Wall Street, there is a, a whole dictionary that is really not exposed to the American public. And I think you know, when they watch movies like Wolf of Wall Street and things like that, they start seeing, oh, all the numbers and think bells and whistles going off. And it's, it's, it's exciting. I mean, you know, Wall Street investing, if done properly, with a good discipline, a strategic focus, and a discipline, you know, you can see Warren Buffett, right? I mean, it's taken him an awful long time to amass that, that obviously, that amount of wealth, right? But that track record. And never wavering and fully understanding and admitting when you're incorrect, taking your losses when you have to. Because as we know, the Berkshire, um, you know, he, he, the reason he named Berkshire was we know why, right? Um, the problem is nobody wants to do it slow and methodical. Everybody wants the quick dime over the slow. Everybody wants, I'm sorry, the, the quick nickel over the slow dime, right? And you and I both know that, you know, generational wealth, even, even, lesser than isn't made in just one market uptick. It takes several recessions, depressions to go through and over the course of one's life, you absolutely can leave a, a really good nest egg behind for your, for your family, for the family name and just generational behind you. But again, that takes a lifetime of steady, disciplined, constant investing and learning. Yeah, you have to start, start early. You have to know that there are always going to be downdrafts that that always are recovered from, and uh, you have to be patient. You know, uh, you can get hurt by not being patient. So, Josh, closing up here, what is it you, you'd really like to let uh, everybody know looking forward and looking ahead? Yeah, I think the most important thing for an individual investor or a corporate four hundred one k plan of a plan sponsor again comes back to performance. And if, if you're a corporation or an individual investor who cares about the future of the planet, issues like climate change, change social justice, uh, uh, gender equality, this is certainly something you should consider because the performance is equal or better. There's mounting evidence that the performance is equal or better to traditional investing. I agree. I agree with you. And clearly, you're the man in the position, but even from this side of the table and uh, from, you know, from the different side of business on the operation side, I agree. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming very real and it's exciting. It, it is. is exciting. It's very exciting. The, flow, the, the growth in this space is unbelievable right now. And uh, it's really a question of education. I agree. Yeah. Bringing people over to, to see so that they understand the value of it. Yeah. I agree. I think, um, you know, all good things take time. They're worth doing, you know. Um, and I think this is going to be one of those where it might be a five or ten year for the next five or ten years where folks like yourself really have to hammer it home and sh keep showing the positive results, the returns, that, they're, that they are real, um, especially in a market where other things are absolutely just falling off the table, whereas, you know, services you guys provide really do have more than just the ob uh, uh, obvious value, really. So, um, well, with that, Josh, we'd like to thank you here from everyone here at Solar Wolf Energy and from all of our followers here at Solar TV. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for being a kind of a beacon of illumination here in a, in a subject where I think a lot of people are going to see what you're already doing. And I think that builds real value in your personal brand as well.
So I'll thank, you. thank you. I'm excited to see your work as well. And uh, so it was a real pleasure. Thank you.